Good evening and welcome to Copperfield's Books virtual event with Alice Henderson in conversation with Mary Ellen Hannibal. My name is Jamie Madsen and I'm the marketing and events coordinator for Copperfield's Books and I'll also be your host for the evening. Copperfield's Books has been committed to literature, education, and creating community together since our founding in 1981. I like to take a moment here in the beginning uh, to thank every one of you for supporting us through COVID-19. We wouldn't be able to offer this free event program without the sales of event books. And for that, we at Copperfields are very grateful. Uh, so just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce tonight's authors. We will be using the chat box to provide links to view upcoming Copperfields events, links to purchase tonight's title, as well as previous works by both Alice and Mary Ellen. And we'll also include my contact details for post event information. Additionally, the Q&A box will be your go-to with any questions or comments for the speakers. The format will feature around 30 to 45 minutes of in conversation and will be followed by a live Q&A. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that says Q&A. Please submit your questions here rather than replying to my post in the chat box. So without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce our first author of the evening, Alice Henderson. In addition to being a writer, Alice is a wildlife sanctuary monitor, geographic information systems specialist, and bioacoustician. She documents wildlife on specialized recording equipment, checks remote cameras, creates maps, and undertakes wildlife surveys to determine what species are present on preserves, while also ensuring there are no signs of poaching. She's surveyed for the presence of grizzlies, wolves, wolverines, jaguars, endangered bats, and more. In conversation with Alice tonight is Mary Ellen Hannibal. Mary Ellen is a longtime journalist specializing in natural history and literature. Her most recent book, Citizen Scientist, Searching for Heroes and Hope in the Age of Extinction, was named one of 2016's best nonfiction books by the San Francisco Chronicle. She is currently a Stanford Media Fellow. Tonight, they're here with us to discuss Alice's latest title, A Solitude of Wolverines, Alice Carter Series Book One. We're all so excited to dive into this mystery. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Mary Ellen. Why don't you go ahead and take it away? Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to have this um, really fun conversation with Alice tonight. And also uh, for working for Copperfields, which is a wonderful bookstore that I absolutely love. And I live in San Francisco. So I, I do um, you know, try to really put my business in local San Francisco bookstores, but you are very local in, in several different locations. And it's very, very important to support you guys. And I really appreciate you keeping the flame alive. I am absolutely thrilled as a person, as a writer, as a wildlife nut to even meet Alice Henderson and then to read this really fun book, A Solitude of Wolverines. And I'm just gonna confess at the outset, I think a lot of people that, that might be on tonight um, are mystery readers. And I'm not, I'm not a mystery reader. I mean, I think they're, now I think they're fabulous now that I've read A Solitude of Wolverines <laughs> because I'm absolutely riveted by the drama of this book. I mean, and the absolute like, oh my God, I'm like, don't talk to me, don't give me dinner. I'm reading my book. I'm reading my book, like leave me alone. I mean, the fun of that. Oh my God, can I say I'm 60 years old. I've never really felt that way before. So I just love what Alice has done here in the narrative. But I'm also like completely transfixed by um, how she has brought Wolverines, which I do know something about, like more about that than about mystery writing, to, um, to the forefront of our minds. So Wolverines, I mean, a friend of mine said, I, I said I was doing this event tonight. I said, you know, here's the name of the book of Solitude of Wolverines. She said, is a Wolverine a wolf? I said, no, 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 no. A Wolverine? is a weasel. <laughs> uh, that's not precisely true. So that would be my first question to you, Alice. What is a wolverine? Well, I'm glad you asked. I, I get that question a lot. Do you mean Hugh Jackman in the Marvel movies or, or the mascot of Michigan? <laughs> so uh, that was one reason I picked uh, 
wolverines to be the first species in the Alex Carter series is not a lot of people know what they are and they're not doing too well. So I wanted to inform readers about this amazing animal. So if I could just share my screen here real quick, I can show you some photos of them. Oh, I think I messed it up. <laughs> Let me try that again. That's okay, it's hard. <laughs> oh no, now I really, sorry, I'm not very experienced with this. Okay, here we go. Okay, okay so wolverines, um, as Marianne Allen said, they are the largest member of the weasel family. And although they only weigh an average of about 35 pounds, they're very fierce and they can take down moose as prey and they've been known to drive grizzlies off of kills. They roam tirelessly through the high country, their high alpine country, and they can climb almost near vertical surfaces in just a matter of minutes. They treat even the most mountainous terrain as if it's flat. And in fact, researchers at Glacier National Park had a GPS receiver on, transmitter on one of them, and they clocked this wolverine climbing 5,000 near vertical feet of Mount Cleveland, which is the tallest peak in Glacier National Park, in 90 minutes, which would take humans, you know, technical gear and many days of doing this. <laughs> um, they are mainly scavengers. Uh, they rely on larger predators like wolves and bears, and they tend to scavenge those kills. And they're very powerful cleaners of the forest because they will eat everything on a carcass. They'll eat the bones, the teeth, and they've been known to eat carcasses that have sat out for like three years on the forest floor. So they're really amazing. And they also have the very rare thing that the mothers will dig these extensive snow dens for the kits with many, many rooms. So there will be like a living room, a sleeping room, a room where she can nurse her kits, a bathroom. And what's really rare in the carnivore world is after those kits leave her, the dad will actually come and show those kits around, show them the ropes of the forest, show them the good scavenging sites. And that's really rare to have paternal care with the carnivores. So let me stop sharing here. That's super fascinating. Every single detail that you just said. <laughs> so, so I'm well, oh, I'm sorry. Just to sort of kind of tack back to a little bit of the beginning. Um, you know, I, I read your book to do this event and I'm so glad to read it and I absolutely loved it. And all of you who love mystery books should read it. It's just a really well plotted, really well written, really gri gripping book. And then I find out that you have also written these, um, some science fiction, quite a few science fiction books, but you're also a wildlife biologist. You're out there actually doing the tracking and the sensing of where these animals are so we get a picture of their lives and the, the forces that are against them and, the, and, and actually how they are contributing to our well-being, which is very fundamental. And I'm, so, so we're, maybe we haven't actually answered what is a wolverine quite yet, because what is a weasel? Let's go back to that and then, <laughs> like well, how you've done this. Because a weasel, I mean, it's not a rodent, so where does where do weasels fit in like next to rodents? So if you think of a wolverine, I mean, and Hugh Jackman's character shows you like really that this is one of the fiercest, most effective um, teeth animal, the most um, persistent, the most able to take down foes that are much larger than themselves. They're fierce and they're fabulous in that way, of course, you don't want to be their target yourself. But what is what what is a weasel in the ecosystem, and what is a wolverine in terms of weasels? So weasels are mustelids. Um, it's a group that includes skunks and badgers, and they generally have a musky scent about them that they can 
wolverines are also musky. In fact, they've been known to break into trappers' cabins and tear up the place and just musk everything so it's unusable. Um, they're carnivores, so the niche they fill is, um, the, the smaller weasels tend to take down rodentia, a lot of rodent prey, um, so they keep those populations in check. And then the wolverine, which is a much, much bigger weasel, <laughs> Um, does take down small prey sometimes, but mostly they're scavengers, so they really help clean the forest. So you're describing a world, and, and soon for the mystery lovers, we'll get onto the plot a little bit, so that if, if you're not as interested in the natural history, there's so much else like that's dramatic that you will be interested in. But this is very dramatic to me, <laughs> because this is what I love to know about. So on, on, on you know, this idea of this food web of um, weasels and then mustelids, like this is the way they've evolved over time and they eat, um, they do kill things themselves. They're not just scavengers, is that right? Yes. So sometimes they kill and then they do, but they also eat scavenged carcasses that other creatures have killed. And, you know, we, we humans like live in a world that is a little bit separate from this, right? We go to the grocery store, we buy our food, we maybe we compost, we recycle, we put things in the garbage, but all of that goes to this vast, like unknown place called away. And we don't think about it after that, but we do have a whole cycle and a whole world about recycling the waste of our lives. So the whole natural world works in a cycle that is very dependent and on, on cycling through dead things and carcasses and bringing it back into new life. And so wolverines are super important in that cycle of life. So we'll spend another minute on this maybe that wolverines were, have been proposed to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. And because, partly because they're, they are very, you correct me, Alice. What I know about it is that they are, you know, they're very um, adapted to very high alpine ecosystems. So to really high areas where there's cold and snow and that, you know, you described the mom making the nice home for the babies in the snow. So they need the snow and they need the high elevations and they're losing that because climate change is warming everything. So we have less snow, we have less cold. So they have to go higher and higher and, and, and so there's less room for them on the world. Is that correct? That is correct. Unfortunately, wolverines have just been having a terrible time um, really since the 19th century. They originally, they were valued for their water repellent lush coats and they were over trapped to extinction in most states, including here in California. And then government run predator control programs have killed off these larger predators that they rely on to scavenge their corpses, uh, the carcasses. And not only does this mean less prey for the wolverines to scavenge, but these poisoning control programs that governments use, both the US and Canada have done this. The poisons work their way into the ecosystem. And even in areas now where there's a limit on how many wolverines trappers can kill, traps kill indiscriminately. So say a trapper puts out a trap for a coyote and they there's nothing stopping that trap from killing a wolverine. So these wolverine kills are considered incidental and they don't count toward any limits imposed by state laws. And on top of that, wolverines are threatened by habitat fragmentation and winter recreation. Like they live in these separated, isolated meta populations. So in order to bring necessary genetic diversity from one population to another, a wolverine has to venture out on its own and cross really dangerous territory. They're facing crossing roads, oil and gas extraction areas, increased housing development and resort development, crowded ski areas. And as Mary Ellen was saying, now they're threatened on top of that by climate change. So wolverines require really deep snowpack to build these maternal dens. And now that the snowpack has been greatly reduced, their denning habitat is, is vanishing. In fact, wolverines used to range as far south as New Mexico and as far east as New York State. But now they only survive in these isolated pockets in parts of the Rockies and the Cascades. 
like there's less than 300 left in the contiguous US. And unfortunately, conservationists have been trying to get them listed since 1994. And US Fish and Wildlife Service repeatedly refuses to list them on the Endangered Species Act. And then a federal judge will say, no, you have to go back and re-examine this because the science clearly shows they're in danger. And in fact, just as recently as this August, US Fish and Wildlife Service once again decided not to list the wolverine. And I mean, there's enormous pressure from the oil and gas industries, trappers and winter recreationists to not list the wolverine. So, uh, you know, I really love the way that you just characterized that. And, and um, you know, I'm, I write about the environment myself uh, in a non nonfiction. And I, you know, have watched and observed and report on the efforts of, of nonprofits and scientists and government officials also to try to protect nature. And I look very much at what are the forces posed against it. And so what, one of the things that was so fun for me about your book was that actually you like dramatize this conflict um, in a way that's super fun to read. Um, you know, your main character is so, she's so amazing. I mean, she's not a, she is a superwoman. But she doesn't like think of herself that way. She's just doing her thing. She's kind of like on the um, the backspin from a bad relationship. She's, um, which I thought was, you know, I mean, I thought that was really something great because I don't know. I know a lot of young women at the moment, like in their late twenties and their early thirties, and they're kind of going like, "Oh my God, you know, I want to, I want a husband, I want a family." but this isn't working out for me. And, you know, I'm 61. So if this is, and I have a happy marriage and two children. So I'm like, oh, you know, don't worry about it, honey. You know, just do, it's gonna work out for you. But I remember, like, it's very painful to be that age. And what are you gonna assert in yourself? What are you gonna do that is your life? What are the choices you are gonna make to be who you are? And in this book, we have a young woman who is just, she's, she can't help it, right? She's just doing what's right for her. And what's right for her is right for Wolverines and for nature. And, you know, her boyfriend, I'm like, oh, he's not bad, honey. You know, he's kind of okay. But she's, you know, it's not working out with him. So I, I just liked that so much. So what about that whole emotional part of your book? I wanted to, you know, I think it's hard in when you're a wildlife researcher and you're spending a lot of time out in the middle of nowhere and you're away from civilization. And if you're trying to have a relationship with that kind of setup, it can really be difficult. And, you know, I see a lot of people that they have these dreams, they have these goals and these passions, sort of let them slide by for the sake of relationships. Um, and I didn't want Alex, my protagonist, to have to do that in this. I, I wanted her to really, you know, she gives the relationship a shot, but really her dream is to help wildlife. And that means being out in the middle of nowhere and to not have a partner that's supportive of that or is trying to undermine it. I mean, you don't want to give up doing good work. If you come to the choice where you're thinking, okay, I could save an endangered species, or I could date this like possessive jerk who's giving me guilt trip, hopefully <laughs> the decision will be an easy one that you're going to go out there and do everything you can for your dream, be it uh, helping wildlife or any kind of dream you want. Well, that's a wonderful response and really so interesting because, you know, he is a controlling jerk, but he's kind of like, a, you know, he's attractive, he has a good job, he actually appreciates her to a certain extent he's not abusive he's not terrible but she wants more you know she's after more and to me this is wonderful this is beautiful and this is what i would want for young women to just like go for more um you know and she's an attractive character i'm quite sure she will find a good partner but um but there is this like pull toward this, it's almost like there's a bifurcation between the civilized world and the 
the uh, more wild world. And this is your setting. Like you have this area that's been made a, um, a nature preserve or it's been protected, but it was a ski resort. So it's a place, this is very, very real. Like this is really where we're at. We have hardly any really wild places left on the earth. We really have hardly any wild places left on the earth. And we really need there to be wild places for the survival of all of us in every way, physical, emotional, spiritual. So you have a place that's in this kind of liminal space between it was um, human dominated with a ski resort. Now it's got the potential to be made more wild. But then there's all these pressures of people who want to purpose the resources there. And then we get into the conflict, the mystery that's going on. Who is really the evil person here? And what is really the evil outcome? And I'm not doing you justice because I'm not a mystery writer, but let me, reader or writer, but let me tell you, this is a really well plotted book. <laughs> so, I mean, really interesting complications, really interesting situations. And then, you know, fabulous conflicts that then are worked out. But, um, but Alice, you know, as a wildlife biologist yourself, what, what are your, how did you pick this kind of space that's sort of a, you know, it's a human slash wild space? Well, maybe, maybe this would be a good time to just give a little snapshot of what the plot is of the book um, in case people aren't familiar with it. So it, it's the first novel in a new series, a new thriller series about a wildlife biologist who encounters dangerous situations while she's out in the field studying endangered species. So in the first novel, she lands a job in remote Northwestern Montana on this vast tract of land that, as you said, is was formerly a ski resort. And Wolverines used to be in the area, but after decades of use by the ski resort, they've disappeared. So now this huge parcel of land has been donated to a land trust, and they're curious to know if Wolverines have returned to the area. So they hire Alex to do this. And she goes out in the field, she places remote cameras out in the hopes of capturing images of these elusive creatures. But when she reviews the footage, she's startled to see images of a severely injured man wandering around on the preserve. When she sets out to help him, she realizes too late that she's stumbled on a secret someone will kill to protect. So that's the setup. And my inspiration for this was I know I've been a writer, I've been a wildlife researcher, and I really wanted to bring those two worlds together. And being out in these remote places, in fact, when I got the idea to write this book, I was in remote Northwestern Montana where the book is set. And I was on a wildlife preserve, hoping to record wolves and also to capture some pictures of wolverines on remote cameras. And I thought, why don't I bring these two together in this remote, setting could be so conducive to a thriller and you're out there, you're isolated, there's no cell service, that sort of thing. And the setting of this place, being on an, an old abandoned, which is now abandoned ski resort, was inspired by a place I was doing a bat survey. And it was the site of this former huge conference center back in the 80s and it had fallen into disrepair. So this building was just falling apart and the windows were all shattered and bats had moved in and you'd open a stairwell door and there would just be no stairs there. And it was just so creepy. So I decided to bring that setting to the Northwestern Montana setting and create just a spooky, like you said, this liminal place that's sort of between where humanity had left a footprint, but also still really wild and set the book there. That's so awesome. Where was the, this place This uh, with the bats? Like it was in Arkansas, so very humid and hot and nature had just retaken these buildings. I mean, trees were growing in through the windows. There was moss on everything. I mean, the bats loved it, but you could hear the wind whistling through broken windows and it was just very inspiring. But one thing I really loved about your book and your writing is actually your evocation of this mystery of the natural world. You know, like we don't know everything about it. We don't know like the half of it. 
And then, you know, when it's taking over or when it's dark and when it's cold or, you know, when there's cycles that we are um, as comfortable participating in as maybe on a noontime on a summer day, um, it's mysterious. It's like, that's the truly mysterious part. And so this really mysterious part of the natural world really intersects with this human story of, you know, the usual things, which are greed and violence and um, dominance that we, you know, seem to be completely um, locked into as a species at the moment anyway. But um, the beauty of your writing about this beautiful place, I mean, it's just, it's lovely. How do you write? I mean, you have a big job out there every day. That's not an easy job. Uh, putting out sensors for bats and listening to their echolocations and doing all this, you know, mapping and software stuff that I don't understand, but I totally appreciate. How do, when do you write? How, how's your day go? <laughs> well, writing just flows into this so well. Um, so I mainly do species presence surveys. So I'll go to a piece of land that's protected and I put out remote cameras, walk transects, search for tracks and scat. And my specialty is bioacoustics. So I'll set out these recorders in the field and with different kinds of microphones, like I use audible mics to pick up birds and amphibians and mammals. And then I use ultrasonic mics to record echolocation calls of bats. So these are left out for days or weeks at a time. And then I collect the recordings and examine them so I can tell what species are using and preserve. And for bats, because they're ultrasonic and we can't hear them, I actually visually look at the spectrographs of the calls and I can tell what kind of species are present. It's a great non-invasive way to study bats because nothing is crabbier or feistier than a bat that's been caught in a mist net and understandably so. Um, so I can figure out which bats are present without having to get hands on with them, which I'm sure they appreciate. Um, and then as you say, you do a lot of mapping and geographic information systems, uh, habitat suitability and that sort of thing. But the great thing about being a writer while I'm doing this is the freedom that I can work from anywhere. And the income from my writing has allowed me to take on a lot of pro bono wildlife work for various nonprofits that have a shoestring budget. So during the day, I'm on the field setting up recorders or remote cameras. And then at night, I can be back at camp uh, hashing out my latest novel. I have this great little portable word processor called an Alpha Smart. They stopped making them, but I mean, they're amazing. They only weigh a pound, so I can just stick it in my backpack and they can save hundreds of pages of text and they're just great portable writing devices. So I can be out where I'm inspired in nature and working on my books. So it just dovetails perfectly into what I'm doing. That is so fascinating, Alice. Thank you so much for doing your life the way that you're doing it. But tell, tell us about, um, shifting from the science fiction world to the mystery world and what gave you the idea to do that? Well I love science fiction, I love writing science fiction, um, but what I love reading more than anything else are thrillers and mysteries and I really thought that this isolated atmosphere, the wildlife could really be conducive to mystery more than any other genre and since that's what I voraciously read the most I just made the plunge and said I'm I really want to write a thriller and just follow my heart and where I wanted to take my writing career. And I have to say, no regrets. The mystery and thriller community is incredibly warm and supportive. And, and I've really lucked out with my team at HarperCollins. Uh, they're just fantastic. And I'm just so glad I made the switch. I mean, I love science fiction, I do, but thrillers are really just where my heart is. Well, I haven't read your science fiction. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours now, for sure. So I want to read more of you. But um, I'm very interested in, um, you know, so you have a big teaser in this book that is like making me wait for your next book. Oh, my God. This mystery guy. And what's going on with that dude? Um, there's a beautiful structure to how you, you did this. Um, was this entirely organic to your process or were you looking at 
kind of um, a good thriller format. I'm sure it went back and forth between both of those, but just curious about your process. Well, I, I really liked that character. And in fact, when my agent took me on, that was a huge selling point for him was that character. And um, we both like the idea of how, I don't want to give anything away. It's kind of hard to talk about him with no spoilers, but um, we really wanted to, I, I knew there would be, uh, that I would address this character and um, maybe hopefully, you know, intrigue people to read the next book to learn about him and what happens with him. And um... I'm waiting because I mean, very interesting, really. I mean, how you have structured the book is very uh, impressive. I mean, just, I'm a writer, I'm writing a book and I'm struggling with it. So I'm looking at, oh my God, how do I structure this book? Like I need to structure it in some kind of rational way. And I'm looking, this book is so well structured. Um, and then with this whole other dimension of this character that leads us to the next book, it's, it's not, there's plenty of satisfaction to this book. And we get to a good, I mean, and that in itself, it's just so well crafted because we're just satisfied with the ending and we got a lot of answers. And, um, but then there's also another question. So another big thing about this book, Alice and I, we talked a little bit the other day and I asked her because I'm of a certain age and that maybe some of you on, on Zoom are, and maybe some of you are too young to remember this TV character, MacGyver. So MacGyver was a TV show. I can't remember the guy's name who played him. He was so cute. Richard remember? Dean Anderson. Oh, he was adorable. I think I had a crush on him and it's just horrible that I can't remember his name. So the MacGyver was all about this guy who was into all of these, could get into these problems and get into these situations. And he was always on the side of good, on the side of wildlife and protection. And I mean, it's an amazing series, but the main thing about it was the guy was really good at making things and making things work. So like, um, you know, vehicles and tools. The guy could take whatever was at hand. If he was sitting in my office, he would look at like what's on my desk and he would make some kind of like contraption out of it. And, and he would be able to write my book for me. And I wish he was here to do that for me. But our character, Alex in A Solitude of Wolverines is like MacGyver and it's so fun. And this is partly why I think this should definitely be a Netflix series. Emphasizing her ability to make things. I mean, she's a woman, but she's, you know, and we don't see women in the maker space in public, in, in very many, you know, kind of images of women. So we got strong women, we got neurotic women, we got dominant women, but we don't have women that are like making stuff and she makes stuff. She figures stuff out, she remembers. There was that, I have these materials over here. I need to do this. I mean, a good chunk of the book is is fascinatingly about what she makes. And I just love that. So are you a maker, Alice? How do you know how to do that? I am. And in fact, I just spent a uh, part of the summer building a radio telescope. And oh. now I'm spending my evenings listening to storms on Jupiter and uh, solar yes. bursts. <laughs> and I do fix my own cars. So I'm definitely... I love tinkering around with mechanical things. And it's so flattering to hear you say that because you don't see female characters like this. And I love the comparison to MacGyver because you know a lot of people remember that he could fix things, but few people remember he, he was a champion for wildlife and for social justice. So, and you just don't tend to see female characters like that. And I really wanted to create Alex to be very competent. Uh, she can fight martial arts. She can fix things. And I wanted that to be the main driving force. You know, a lot of the times you read these thrillers where there's female characters and they're really just there to have a relationship with the male characters. So I really just wanted her to be someone who could stand on her own, who could fight and think her way out of dangerous situations and fix things if the need arise. I, I really want you to pursue this. I mean, who knows if Hollywood is ready for you or not, but try for it. So we want Alex, the strong female character, doesn't need the relationship, big maker of things, and wilderness advocate. 
Oh, I mean, come on. I am signing up for that. I would just subscribe to a new channel altogether just to watch that. But if there's Thank so much there, there's so much there. Thank you so much. So just to circle back to what we began with a little bit about the Endangered Species Act and about wolverines. I mean, I think that one thing that's very complicated for people to kind of understand about it, endangered species is we don't, of course, none of us want species to go extinct. We don't like that idea at all, but we don't like actually really protect them or put as much resources behind protecting them as we could because we don't see it as really, you know, very directly related to our own well-being. You know, like if, if I live in San Francisco, there was a proposition to put big high rises on my corner. Oh my God, I was down at City Hall every day for that. I mean, I am also down at City Hall all the time on wildlife things, but that's because that's what I care about. But I think it's hard to convey, like why does a wolverine need to exist? What happens when we, what happens if they don't exist? I agree. And I think so many people don't understand the interconnectedness of things that if one species disappears, it's not just in a vacuum going away and it has a zero effect. I think one of the strongest examples I've heard of this, have you heard that when they reintroduced wolves into Yellowstone, it ended up changing the course of the rivers. So it had this huge cascade effect. So they reintroduced the wolves that kept the elk populations in check, which had been browsing down all of the willows. And then the willows were able to come back and provide that ecosystem for species. And then the banks were restored from being over eroded and the rivers ended up changing their course because of wolves. So it's amazing how everything is connected. So it's not just that these wolverines will vanish in a vacuum. And I mean, everything is connected and it's something I think we need to somehow drive home more strongly. Well, my book before my citizen science book is called The Spine of the Continent. And it's a, a large part of it is about, you know, the main tenets of conservation biology, one of which is the importance of the top predator on the environment. And that, that work on, on Yellowstone, I reported on that. So that book came out in 2012. That book, that, that research was already really coming out a lot that uh, you know, these researchers that were hydrologists, they were water people, were looking at this Lamar River in Yellowstone. Yellowstone is like this gigantic swath of land and it's protected. So that this, you know, these, these two researchers were saying like, why are these the banks of this river so degraded? How could they be degraded when it's protected? And um, at the same time that they started looking at that, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. And wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone simply because really um, the National Park Service said, you know, national parks should have as much of a complement of native species as we can possibly sustain. Like it should be what it was. So wolves had been exterminated from Yellowstone and they said, that's not right. We need to bring them back. And when they reintroduce them, wolves have, have recolonized Yellowstone really well, and the river started to heal. And that's just this amazing, beautiful story of interconnectivity. And it's, I think, well, you know, wolves are top predators, so it's a little easier to show the cause and effect. And as you just beautifully explained, um, you know, there's something called the ecology of fear. They made deer um, move on down the road and not like chow down on, on the vegetation so hard because the deer are worried about wolves on the landscape so they keep moving. But wolverine are more occult and that word I think means hidden. You know, and there's, there's even fewer wolverines than there are wolves and they are, you know, they're carnivores slash scavengers. So they don't have the same top down forcing effect that wolves have, but, um, but they are a seriously huge part. You know, we do send our garbage away, but we actually really need the nutrients of, of dead things to be recycled through the environment. And yeah. wolverines do that for us. I mean, they, they recycle things for us. They're the recyclers of nature. 
they're among other other creatures that are too. They and, also, so I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. They also fulfill a really important function. They have such powerful noses that they can dig up, say, an elk that's been caught in an avalanche during the winter. Wow. And when you're out in the field, researchers have noticed that, especially in the winter, the wolverine tracks will be followed by coyotes, foxes, other weasels. They'll just follow wolverines around because the wolverines know where all the carcasses are and they dig them up out of deep snow. And so they provide food for these other creatures. Not only are the grizzlies and wolves providing the wolverines with food, but then the wolverines are providing food for these other animals a little lower down. So they really are valuable in these ecosystems. They are. So th that's really beautifully put out. So I'm, I'm, I want to look at some of these questions on the uh, chat so we can respond to them. But while I do that, will you tell us, are you working on a sequel? Or are you working on the next one? I am. Um, I The next one's off to my editor. And oh, and wow. Yeah. Alex Carter is in the Canadian Arctic studying polar bears. So I wanted to choose another species that's on the brink. And as, as you all know, um, the sea ice is just shrinking at staggering levels. So these bears that rely on sea ice to use as platforms to hunt seals during the icy periods of the year, then they fatten up on this seal blubber. And that allows them to fast during the long summer months that are ice free. But because less and less sea ice is sticking around, it's disappearing much faster and it's late to reappear. These polar bears are just having to fast for longer and longer periods every year and they can't nurse their cubs because they're both starving and it's just a terrible situation. So I really felt passionately about addressing polar bears in the next book. I'm so glad that you did. I mean, it's, um... As an environmental reporter, basically, I'm on this, you know, subject every single day, and so I, uh, at a certain level, I'll just confess that I think polar bears are probably toast. You know, like they're probably, actually, they're not going to survive. The crazy thing about polar bears, I mean, they are on the Endangered Species Act. However, they made an exception for the oil, the oil and gas extraction industries, and that's their main threat. So. It's, it's pretty ridiculous. They definitely need better protection. So that's really when you, when you say that, you know, I think it really highlights that there's kind of a war of interests. And it's not only bad guys versus good guys. It's kind of a war within our own hearts of how we live and the choices that we each make. And, you know, I'm bad as anybody else. I've got like Amazon things coming to my house. I'm buying books constantly through Amazon. You know, and I'm, I'm looking at like, I don't know what the right thing to do is. I need to write about these things. I need those resources. It's COVID, I can't get my library books. Um, you know, we all feel kind of backed into a corner, but we really do have to figure our way out of this better than this. And, um, and actually these species are, are, are calling hearts, you know, we can't let polar bears or wolverines go away. That's it's not right. It's that's not right. And we all know that it's not right. Like that's just a moral profound thing in our guts. We know, nope, you can just make a decision on behalf of those creatures and that's what we need to do. Absolutely. And that's a great segue into what we wanted to talk about with citizen science. I mean, in the back of A Solitude of Wolverines, there's a section on how you can learn more about them and volunteer opportunities. Even if people live in the state of Washington, you can actually go out in the winter and track them and you can support organizations that are supporting Wolverine research. So, and I was thinking, um, I mentioned earlier that Wolverines have vanished from California. They were hunted to extinction here, but one appeared in Truckee in 2008 and it was visiting um, some bait stations and got captured on wildlife cameras and they tested some of its genetic material which it leaves you know they leave hairs and stuff behind and it had actually come all the way from Idaho so it had crossed hundreds of miles of dangerous territory to get down here but unfortunately the males travel a lot farther than the females so 
the male ended up living on his 10 year life cycle here in Truckee just by himself and never met another female. So if we could get more people involved or interested in, you know, if you have a vacation home in Tahoe or you're up there visiting, you know, put out wildlife cameras yourself, see if, see if other wolverines are making it all the way down here and just start engaging uh, citizen scientists more to collect data. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Alice. I think I really find citizen science to be this like huge beacon of hope and promise for every reason. And you know, it's just this open source software platforms and does everything we want. You know, we want our kids to learn science and we want them to have a hands-on experience in the wilderness. We want a direct relationship with nature ourselves, and this is a way to do it. So interestingly about what you brought up of having, you know, you have a beautiful place in Tahoe maybe, and you could put up wildlife cameras. I want to know though, what I want is for a place for you to give your data to. Like not like just not you just having it, but who would you give it to? And so this is kind of a networked thing that I think we still need to kind of get to. If and I'm sure that both Alice and I would be very happy to help anybody that uh, wants to put up how, you know, we will help you tell you where to give your data to. But this is why I love iNaturalist. iNaturalist is a, an app that you can put on your phone. And I, I think it's better to sign up on a on desktop and then put it on your phone. You make observations of nature. You see nature yourself. It's not putting up a camera that it doesn't have the same effect is what um, Alice is describing with a camera on your property. But I mean, you see, like if you saw Wolverine, you took a picture of it, it would it would give the date, time, the latitude, and longitude of that observation. And then just having it in iNaturalist gives it to a community of scientists that can use it. So that's what we want to do here is share the information. And that's like the capacity of our incredible, you know, connectivity today. That is like, we have the connectivity because of COVID, which is very scary. On the other hand, we have like this incredible connectivity that gives us the ability to share information that is useful to so many people. And so iNaturalist is a great entry level thing for um, citizen science. We have Jamie back. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> Hi, that was so fascinating and thought provoking and I really, just admire what both of you are doing. And for all of you, um, Alice has shared in the chat box how to get involved. I hate to cut you off, but we have quite a few questions. Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. And, you know, just to start, there's so many people pouring in comments thanking you and, and how stoked they are for this event. Um, okay. James is wondering do wolverines ever attack humans? <laughs> That's incredibly rare. Um, the only time you really have wolverine human contact like that is say if a trapper's caught one in the trap and arrives on the scene and the wolverine is still alive. Um, there's one, I don't know if this is true or not, but there's one anecdote that a trapper had trapped a wolverine. He thought it was dead and he put it on his back. Like, oh my uh, his, uh, the paws were hanging down and it, it woke up as he was hiking back to his cabin and just destroyed this guy's face. So, but I mean, you have to, Wolverines just want to be left alone. They want to avoid humans. They're very rarely any human Wolverine contact. In fact, some Wolverine researchers have never seen one like live. They've captured them on remote cameras, but never actually seen one walk by. That's how incredibly rare and elusive they are. I definitely don't want to see one. <laughs> Scary. I wouldn't mind seeing a wolverine. Because I think they would leave you alone. I don't want to see a grizzly bear. That bear. And I think a wolf would be like mezzo mezzo, like they'd probably leave you alone. But I mean, if they went after you, then I wouldn't want that at all. But I mean, a grizzly bear is more aggressive. But <laughs> I had close encounters with all three of those species, uh, grizzly bears, wolverines, and wolves. And I have to say they were completely indifferent to me. Like, could not care less. The, the Wolverine just looked at me like, I see you there. It just went on its way. So, you're a hero, you are brave. <laughs> <laughs> they just, yeah, they're not interested. Oh, 
Okay, well, Jason is wondering, well, first he said, thanks for putting this together. I received the book on Tuesday and have already finished it. I did not want to put it down. I love how Alice has written such a sp suspenseful novel full of so much great info without being preachy. Alice, you mentioned that you were out doing audio recording for wolves and bats. Can you describe that process? Do you do anything else while out in the field or do you focus on the audio side of things? I really love the audio side of things specifically because they're non-invasive. And um, I do mainly do tracking and I look for poop. I have found Wolverine poop. When I set out the remote cameras, um, I've well, I've seen two wolverines in the wild, one in British Columbia and one in Glacier National Park. Both times I was so excited, I completely forgot I had my camera with me. So <laughs> I've never actually been able to capture them on a remote camera, but I've seen them live and forgotten I had my, my DSLR with me. But so those are the main things. Um, Bioacoustics is, I'm really getting into that. It's it's such a great way to get a whole landscape of what's going on because you can put these recorders out and then you leave the area. And so, so many species that are, don't want to be around humans, like the ones we just mentioned, grizzlies and wolves and wolverines, will come over to, you know, you put them up in areas like meadows or fields or stream corridors, and they'll come and visit these areas just like they always do, not being afraid of humans being there. And so you get this amazing idea of what's happening when humans aren't there, like whole oral landscapes of, you know, can hear raccoons fishing at night and the coyotes coming later to pick up the whatever is left over and frogs singing and it's just incredible. It's such an interesting and fresh new take on it too. I just, I don't know, I love the work you're doing. Um, Jason has a second question. He's wondering, do you have any other interesting stories from being out in the field while doing research? Do you? I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, I have a funny story. Um, that same trip when I was out in Montana and I'd set out my recorders in the hopes of getting wolves. Um, I'd set them out and it grew dark. So I was back and I had this little hard-sided camper that I can use in grizzly bear territory. So I retired to my little, my little camper and I heard this shuffling around outside the camper and I thought, is it wolves? You know, is it? And I opened the door and this set of glowing eyes were all looking in at me. And I was like, oh, it's wolves, I'm gonna get wolves. And, and it was really quiet. And then I heard one, moo. It was actually cattle that had trespassed onto this wildlife preserve and they had surrounded the camper, so. <laughs> It was wolves. <laughs> Cows are everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for that. Um, kind of a second question from Lissa. Is it hard to distinguish all of the different noises you pick up on your equipment? How do you know what exactly you're listening to? That's such a great question. And the hardest part is, um, is if there's a lot going on. So when I set up my recorders, for example, I don't record at say dawn and dusk because so many birds are all singing at once that that can be really hard to isolate different bird calls. So some of it is tricks of like when you're recording and how long you're recording. And the fascinating thing about bats is that every species of North American bat has its own unique echolocation pulse. So when they're searching for prey and they're sending out a pulse, sending out a pulse, the pulse of a little brown bat, for example, will look very different from a big brown bat or say a silver haired myotis. So it's really neat bats, I just bats are my jam. <laughs> you can really tell different species from each other because of how unique they are. And then of course, things like wolves and coyotes and those are easy to, to tell from each other. I love bats too, and it's really a, a bad year for them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you actually talk about that, Alice, about kind of like, I'm sure people feel like maybe we should get rid of bats because we don't want bats giving us coronavirus. So why do we still need bats? Bats are such, they're so important. I mean, not only do they keep mosquito populations in check and uh, cut down on other diseases, you know, Zika and West Nile virus and things that are carried by by mosquitoes, but they're very important pollinators. A lot of people don't know that. I mean, they 
they pollinate all kinds of plants, guava and all kinds of fruits that we eat. And if anyone likes to drink tequila, they, they're the pollinators of agave and they're very important in our ecosystem. I mean, the, it's very rare, you know, that a lot of people have this idea that bats have rabies, for example, but it's extremely rare for a bat to have a disease like rabies. So they're really misunderstood. I'm glad you addressed that. Thanks for that question, Mary Ellen. Um, Mycroft is wondering, you've entered, and this is a really interesting question. Hi, Alice, you've entered two fields dominated by men, writing, uh, writing and wildlife biology. Do you have any suggestion for women who might wish to break into those fields, especially biology? Thanks. Hi, Mycroft. Um, I would say, you know, don't, you're probably, you know, when you go to conferences, there's people that are going to be very dismissive and rude to you and belittle you and underestimate you. And I think the key is really just keep your chin up. There's going to be those jerks and just, you know, they're not worth your time. Go and seek out the fellow researchers that that really care about wildlife and they're not seeing you like through your gender and they're really about what we're all here for, you know, to, to help these endangered species. And I would say the same thing about writing. And depending on the genre you're writing in, um, it can be pretty misogynist, some of them. So uh, mystery, thankfully, mystery and thriller is a very welcoming genre to women. And it's just so great to be in this genre. So again, just if some guy, you know, is rude to you at a con or is hitting on you, like not treating you like you're there to be a fellow writer, a fellow colleague, just, and I, and I would say, you know, these days definitely call them on it. It is absolutely unacceptable. So let people know that this person's behaving this way. Thanks for that. So we have two final questions that I think are perfect to kind of lead us out for the evening. Um, James is wondering, do you have a pub date for the polar bear book? That's a good question for my editor <laughs> um, who's here. <laughs> but I, I think we're shooting for fall 2021. So the same time that, that this will be out. All right, sorry, the, the same time of year this one came here. <laughs> Gosh, and hopefully by then, you know, I know it's rare to uh, think this, but maybe we'll be back in person under the same. Be amazing. So oh, here's my editor now. She says, yes, fall yes. 2021. Awesome. Awesome. And one last question here. Is there anywhere where we can follow your wildlife research work? Oh, um, well, I have a website for my wildlife work. Should I paste that into the, but I don't really, Actually, blog about it I wanted anything. to confirm, is it the alicehenderson.com? That's my writer website. Okay. So, so a totally different one here. I'll, I'll type it in here. Please do. And then we will be sending around a follow-up email tomorrow that will include a link to the recording. It will include, um, you know, the link for tonight's book as well as previous titles. And we'll include all of these websites that Alice has so, you know, gratefully provided for us. So um, yeah, any last thoughts before we kind of wrap it up? It's been such a wonderful evening. Oh, I wanted to show our covers. So yes, um, I don't yet have my hardback for A Solitude of Wolverines, but I do have this galley and I just wanted to show everyone this amazing cover that um, the artist of this is Elsie Lyons. And I just, I'm so, excited about this cover. It's just amazing. It's got the stormy sky and here's Alex Carter on the move. But I do have a hardback of Mary Ellen's book. <laughs> so here's her phenomenal citizen scientist book about, I mean, it's part memoir, it's informative, uh, you can, it's inspiring and it's just a great read. I suggest it to everyone. Yes, and I included that in the chat box and we'll include it in tomorrow's email as well. Um, you know, I'm so excited to read this. And again, I'm so bummed I didn't get my advanced reader copy, but now I get to support you. So thank you both for being with us this evening. And you know, it'd be great to have you back soon. Super thank you so much. So much. And thank you, Alice, for doing just a wonderful job as a writer and as a biologist. Thank you for joining me today, Mary Ellen. I'm so glad you were here. And thank you, Jamie, for hosting this. This has just been great. I really appreciate the opportunity. It's our pleasure. Well, have a great evening and hope to see you soon. You too. Good night.